Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. It is another summer Monday. I am Amanda Carpenter sitting in for the Charlie Sykes. And joining me, as always, is my colleague, Will Salatin. How are you, Will? Uh, It's hot, Amanda. Oh, my God, is it hot. (laughs) (laughs) Really? It's summer. It's August. I went out yesterday, and I was trying to play tennis. And just, I came back, and my wife said, you know, your shirt's all the same color. And the color was sweat, totally soaked. Then I'm, like, watching the city open, the tennis tournament here, where, like, the players also are completely soaked. Uh, It's a completely miserable experience. Hoping things get better from here. Well, did you try to go out in the morning or the afternoon? Personally, I love this time of year. Like, I love it when you step outside and it's like a sauna, not for a long period of time, but like, I just, I love a couple super hot, humid days in August where it's just like an oven washing over you. I absolutely love it. God bless you. God bless you. Let me, let me introduce you to Texas, which is like (laughs) plus five degrees, plus 5% humidity from Washington, even better. Hmm. Well, I do get a kick out of all the seasons. I I love a really cold day. I love a really windy day. So any kind of extreme for a few days, I get a lot of enjoyment out of. So um, don't play tennis in the middle of the day. Try to do it early in the morning. And just in a couple of weeks, you'll have a nice, beautiful fall day to go out and enjoy. All right. I'll take you up on that. So there's so much weird, insane, frustrating news happening on the Republican side. I want to start fresh. I want to keep this good mood going. I want to have a good week. We're going to have a good Monday because Joe Biden is having a good week and I don't love everything that's happening, but I want to share the enjoyment uh, that he is getting from his legislative victories just for fun. So how are you feeling about Joe Biden's big week? Well, you know, Biden had nowhere to go but up. I mean, the story about <laughs> Biden was that- You're so that, How are you trying to be the <laughs> pessimist here? No, no, I'm, this is disguised optimism. So like, if you start out with the assumption that everything's bad, then you're pleasantly surprised all the time, right? So I'm pleasantly surprised. That, and that's basically the media coverage that Biden is getting this week is that the story on Joe Biden was he's not getting anything done. You know, there's bad inflation, gas prices are high. And then when things start to go well, it's just like, oh my goodness, the story of the week is is Joe Biden is succeeding. I mean, he already had a lot of this stuff in the bank, right? He had the infrastructure bill. It was just that the Build Back Better plan had, you know, wasn't going anywhere. And that was the headline. And once that logjam broke um, and Joe Manchin signed on and Kirsten Cinema signed on and the bill goes through, you know, now we have this success story. And then reporters start mentioning all the other stuff, the gun control bill, which wasn't that big a deal, but hey, he got it passed. And then, you know, the the chips bill, the pact bill, the burn pits for aid to veterans. And, you know, some of the economic news, like, yeah, gas prices are bad, but they're not as bad as they were a month ago, right? They're down from like around five bucks to four bucks, roughly, right? And great jobs numbers, uh, really low unemployment rate. Oh, and we killed another, you know, Al-Qaeda boss. So so that's only enough to feel kind of pretty good and it's better than where we were a week ago. What I'm saying is I think Democrats should be feeling really good. Are we afraid to be happy? Is that some of what is happening here? Because you you just ticked off a ton of amazing things. I mean, I was listening to Chris Murphy on Morning Joe uh, this morning, Senator Chris Murphy, and he put together something that I hadn't heard before and made me stop and think, wow, I I think the Democrats are really on to something here. And it's where he mentioned that it is really incredible that in just over the past few weeks, the Democrats have taken on the gun industry uh, with the gun reform bill. They have taken on the oil industry with the climate uh, bill that just passed, and they've taken on big pharma with the prescription drug price negotiation, and they've won every time. That's something that hasn't happened before, and they did it with only you know a 50-50 majority in the Senate. That's a big deal, as Joe Biden would say with a F in the middle of it, don't you think? All right, so you're right. Yeah, I'm realizing as we're talking about this that I am a victim, I am a participant in this bizarre psychological phenomenon among Democrats, which is I am obsessed with the things that we haven't gotten. I am obsessed with the defeats. I'm obsessed with bracing for the midterm defeat. Uh, like, for example, you're talking about all the all the industries that the Democrats overcame. And honestly, Amanda, I'm still thinking about the hedge fund guys who managed to, mm-hmm. through Kirsten Cinema managed to push the carried interest loophole out of the climate bill that that Manchin signed in. It is very weird 
that me as the former Ted Cruz communications director is trying to teach you how to be happy with your big FDR liberal wins. <laughs> you know, and I'm not usually the FDR guy. Like, I am actually a very <laughs> moderate person. I'm I kind of like, joking. I, yeah, and I voted for Larry Hogan, and I'm like, I'm not really a Democrat, but I'm experiencing this like a Democrat. Like, I can't believe they had to dump the carried interest loophole. And and you know the the and 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 the other thing, Amanda, is you're right when you list all of the policy wins. And yet, I look at you know the polls still showing like turnout and, you know, enthusiasm, uh, advantage for Republicans in the midterms. And, you know, historically that, you know, the party in power will lose seats and we only have like three or four seats to spare. So I am in this mentality of things we didn't get losses that are coming, you know, it will only go so far industries we didn't overcome. It's true. It's true. I'm in, I'm stuck in that mentality. Sorry. Oh my gosh. Well, let me sprinkle some more cherries on your Sunday and make you enjoy this beautiful ice cream cone on this hot summer day. In addition to these policy wins that the Democrats are racking up, they've also forced Republicans to take what I think are pretty stupid positions. I mean, just look at last week on that burn pit bill where John Stewart was openly shaming Republicans for refusing to give money to the troops to be treated for cancer that they got because they were sucking down fumes outside these burn pits serving their country. Um, you have them, on, I think, on the wrong side of this prescription drug negotiation bill. I mean, I, it is a funny thing that conservatives who typically want to save the government money are in the position of saying, no, we would very much like the government to keep paying really, really high prices for drugs um, that people need to survive. They were successful. The Republicans were successful in killing the cap on insulin, which is another position I do not understand. It's not like there's a black market for insulin and people are hoarding it you know, to sell to their fellow junkies on the street or something. There's no black market bartering for insulin. If you need it, you need it to survive. There's no other purpose for this drug that I am aware of. And for some reason, we can't cap it at an affordable price for people to survive. I mean, that that is the position that they took and won in the midst of this broader legislative fight over the weekend. First of all, I hope I, I do want to talk about that that Republican response about being being unhappy that the government is saving money on the drugs. I think we have a couple of clips on that we can get to. Can we tee that up? It's a, a clip Rick Scott was talking about it over the weekend. So, Margaret, here's the way I look at it. Uh, right now, this bill actually ought to be called the War on um, Seniors Act. I mean, this is a war on Medicare. You look at this. This is a $280 billion cut in Medicare. So what's going to happen is Medicare is going to get cut and there's going to be seniors that don't get life-saving drugs because the reducing pharmaceutical Medicare industries will not be able to have to. Reducing Medicare costs is not the same as reducing to, benefits, though. You, you know that. Margaret, it's $280 billion that would have been spent. It was anticipated to be spent. It's not going to be spent now. Okay. Go ahead. Well, unpack that one for me because Rick Scott is not a stupid person, right? He was elected to the Senate, former governor of Florida um, as a businessman, I believe, from the medical industry. So he knows exactly what he's talking about here, but it sounded, you know, nonsense to me. Well, it makes perfect sense if you were hearing it from Bernie Sanders. What's weird is hearing it from Rick Scott. I mean, Margaret Brennan, the host of Face the Nation, is, is, is reminding him, this is the government saving money, right? It's, it's not, and, and it's not a cut in the benefit. It's a cut in what they're paying for the, how much they're going to pay pharma for the drugs. And, and Scott's response is, yeah, but it's money that would have been spent that is not going to be spent. Now that is what you expect to hear from the left, right? Like, Hey, we're spending less money. Um, what is the point of Republicans if Republicans are going to just trot out the left's talking points when Democrats try to save money by spending less on these programs, right? This is going to be a cut in expenses. It's going to save the taxpayers money. And the response from Rick Scott and frankly, other Republicans who were on the Sunday shows is they're cutting your Medicare. Now, this is not the first time we've heard that from Republicans. You know, famously, like when, when Obamacare was being discussed, it was the same argument from Republicans. They became the left. They became the party of, hey, they're, you, you, Mr. and Mrs. Medicare recipient, you um, have money coming to you from the government, and this thing is going to take away your benefit. 
you know, that is not what the party of fiscal responsibility says. That is what the party of spending says. So Republicans have become the party of spending. Yeah, what he, I believe that he is trying to do, but is really doing in a clunky, incomprehensible way, is trying to argue against price controls. Correct. You know, Republicans traditionally do not want the government to impose price controls because if you make goods too cheap, you know, too inexpensive, the companies can't make money and therefore there will be no companies anymore. I don't find this argument applicable to a lot of the prescription drugs, particularly insulin, right? Because that is that should be a generic drug by now. It's in we've had it around forever. There's no special proprietary value assigned to it. And so the cost of production should be pretty low. And if it's not low enough, well, then maybe that's the case where we would need actual government price supports. Because again, these are medicines that people depend on to survive. It's not a luxury good. We're not talking about, you know, corporate subsidies for a company to relocate to, you know, whatever town in the middle of some rural state to create jobs, which I would have an easier time arguing against than this. Right. And there is a legit argument about price controls, that price controls mess with the economics of things. And the explicit argument from Republicans about the drug price controls is that you won't get drugs produced because it costs money to produce them. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's some truth to that in some cases, but Republicans are either incredibly naive or incredibly cynical in their constant assertion that anything we do to corporations will be passed on to people, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's that any tax increase on a company will be passed down. And yes, some are. But the, you know, the Republican position sort of assumes that there is no slack in the system, that there's no such thing as companies taking record profits, which we know that, for example, the fossil fuel companies have been doing. Um, and in the case of, the, the, of the, the drug prices, I mean, this is a really complicated subject and you probably know it better than I do. But um, basically, the United States subsidizes a lot of other countries by, you know, we, we pay a lot for the drugs. And we are the money that we pay goes into research that the companies do. And then the companies are sell it on the secondary. They go out and sell it to other countries, to people in other countries, um, less developed countries, for less. People out there can get less because we already paid for the research. So it's just that, you know, Americans think that we're going to get the best quality, you know, drugs or the first crack at them by doing this. But it's expensive and it's legit to question that. And a party that was truly interested in fiscal responsibility would be more interested in this. Yeah, well, I think the Democrats should stay on this, even though they got the bigger win, stay on the issue of insulin, because I think that's something that is so easy to understand. And I, I do give credit for Bernie Sanders shoving that particular issue to the forefront, I think with a road tour he did. But that was the first time I actually heard about how expensive it was, heard about people rationing that particular drug. And again, there's no other use for it. There's no reason to make people have to beg, plead, borrow, and steal to get it. As you probably know, losing weight is impossible when you can't control those cravings throughout the day. Salty snacks or sweet treats are always within reach. What about the temptation at all of those summer barbecues? Well, the new weight control formula from Nusu Labs uses biohacking technology to curb your appetite and control those unwanted cravings. Formulated with natural ingredients and antioxidants, this new weight control formula helps you maximize a healthy metabolism and keeps you away from all of those empty calories safely, naturally, and without the harmful side effects of restrictive diets and supplements. And this one-of-a-kind formula has the mood-enhancing ingredient that you find in dark chocolate to keep you from getting hangry. Nusu guarantees that you will lose up to three pounds in the first week, and it's guaranteed or your money back. And right now, you get a free bottle with your order. That's nusulabs.com slash bulwark, nusulabs.com slash bulwark. Join Nusu's world-class concierge program for an extra 10% off at checkout. Free monthly supply, free priority shipping. That's nusulabs.com slash bulwark, N-U-S-U labs, nusulabs.com slash bulwark. These statements and products have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease or condition. These statements and information are not a substitute for or alternative to seeking care from your health care providers. Okay, I want to talk about the story. It's been going on for a few months now. Um, 
but it's the kind of high stakes politics that I think we've never seen before. And it has to do with the governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, and the governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey. So after the Biden administration starting pulling back some of the Trump-era immigration laws, uh, particularly Title 42, which essentially just, you know, allowed asylum seekers to come here, um, there's been an explosion of immigration at the border. Yeah, this isn't good. really yeah, anything okay. new. Sorry. It kind of Thank happens every out. summer. Oh, sure. But these two governors are fed up, and what they started doing in April, they announced they're going to start doing it in April. They've been doing it over the past few months, is just taking these migrants— And shipping them to New York in Washington, D.C. And saying, you know what? You guys want to have sanctuary cities? You deal with the problem. And, I mean, you look at the pictures and there's people are just camping out in the middle of Union Station. I mean, they're sending multiple buses a day at this point, just dumping people in these cities. Have you, what have you read about this? Well, you know, I've seen a little bit of coverage of it. I have not seen the encampments myself. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of, Amanda, I'm honestly torn about this issue because I, to be fair, I think that Abbott, Greg Abbott and Dunk Ducey, the governors of Arizona, of Texas and Arizona, uh, have a point and it's a legit point that people, you know, the liberals who don't live in the border States are sort of not looking at this. I mean, if mm-hmm. you're watching Fox, you're seeing border stuff all the time. Like, here's what's going on at the border. Here's people coming across. It's a constant story. If you're watching the mainstream media, the sort of quote unquote liberal side of the media, you're generally not seeing this. It's somebody else's problem. And that is not a healthy way to live. It's not healthy to have this bifurcation where we don't pay it. We treat it like it's your problem, border states. But it's also not healthy, Amanda, for the governors to respond this way. It's not healthy for the response to be this sort of underhanded backstage way where we're going to just randomly put people on buses and ship them to whatever cities we don't like. Like, who do we hate? Washington, Washington, D.C., New York City. And the other thing that's really bothering me about this, Amanda, is that the people in Texas who are putting these migrants on the border, according to the migrants, they're lying to them. Yeah. They're telling the migrants, when you get to the other end of this bus in Washington, D.C., for example, there are people waiting to take care of you. And that may be sort of what, in general, conservatives in Texas believe. But in fact, these people are arriving. And that's not true. They're, you know, they've been deceived. And that is morally wrong to lie to these people and send them on their way. Yeah. We've had this debate since I came to Washington in 2005. Illegal immigration and what are we going to do about it? was always the hottest topic. When I was writing at Human Events, Washington Times, when I worked in Jim DeMint's office, when I worked for Ted Cruz, and so on, as we saw Donald Trump making an issue. It is an issue. And I don't know how many times I have been lectured or told by liberals that the only people who care about this issue are essentially racist, that don't want brown people coming to the country. Sure, that sentiment exists. I do not deny it. But when you have a problem of humans showing up and you cannot stop the flow, overwhelming services to the point where, you know, under many presidents, they have been put into cages and camps and buildings against their will and housed there as we try to figure out what to do with these people. And for the governors to say, you know what, we're done with this. You will deal with this problem now. You know, I I agree with you. They do have a point. It just, it makes me so sick that these people are being lied to in the process. And there's a New York Times story about it, which everyone should go read. And the people who come here are lied to. There was a woman saying, I saw on TikTok how easy it was to get here and how welcoming people were. And essentially saying, I didn't think it was going to be a problem. It's a huge problem. And, you know, Union Station, we're both in the D.C. area I've always felt safe there. And I don't know if you saw the story recently about how Starbucks was pulling out, talking about the crime, the homelessness in there. Somehow this wasn't part of the story. It's clearly part of the story. It's where hundreds of people are being dumped in the food court and camping on the plaza outside. And there was quotes in the story from, you know, um, people in New York and D.C. who were forced to deal with this. And they said, oh, well, we thought Abbott was just pulling a media stunt and he was just doing this for a hit on Fox News and this would go away. 
but they keep sending buses. And I'm like, what do you think is happening at the border? Have you not been listening to these people scream about why this is such a problem and we don't have the services to help these people? And meanwhile, Democrats keep pretending like it's not a problem. It, it's sort of unbelievable that it took this kind of dramatic action to make these people who purport to care about this problem and want to serve these people acknowledge what a problem it actually is for the people who have to care and serve these people. I think your points are absolutely legit. And I'll speak to my crowd. I'll speak to folks who are on the left side of the spectrum. And this is true for everybody, right? A couple of lessons here. One is don't look the other way. You can't say, I'm not going to pay attention to this problem. This is something Fox News cares about. Therefore, I don't. It's a it's a real problem. The, I, the numbers that I saw, Amanda, were like in the first, you know, eight months of this year, it's already, they've already had double the number of people coming in from like from last year. That that I believe that's the number. The other thing is we can't have chaos. And if you don't take seriously the problem of illegal immigration, you are condoning chaos. If you believe in immigration and you are you're anti-racist and you believe that America should be, you know, open, you have to support an orderly system. And the orderly system has to be that when people come in, they are, you know, I, I mean, a lot of this stuff is asylum claims and it's a little bit complicated, but, you know, Donald Trump was awful and he ignored the law, but he was sending a message to the world, don't come here. And Democrats have to find a lawful way to send that message. Alejandro Mayorkas has not been able to send that message. You know, he just doesn't project seriousness about it. Joe Biden doesn't project seriousness about not coming. And as you're saying, these people are seeing on TikTok and social media, they're seeing, hey, you can get across the border easily. Somehow, Democrats need to take control of immigration the way that they need to take control of crime and show the public that we can solve these problems, face these problems and solve these problems in an orderly way, or there will be chaos and there will be this kind of underhanded stuff coming from the Republicans. Um, I don't care how much of a bleeding heart liberal you may be. You cannot be a humanitarian and look at the way these people are treated from the lies they're told about how easy it is to come here, to how they're treated when they get here, to now when children were separated and they're being shipped like animals all across America and say that is somehow okay. A strong border policy is actually the more humane policy, in my opinion. And if the Democrats could adopt that ground and take this issue away from the Republicans, which they have used to beat and beat and beat Democrats— in so many swing states for years, I don't think Republicans would know what to do. Yeah. And one other thing I wanted to add to your point, both sides here are being absolutely hypocritical. First of all, what these governors are doing, what the states are doing when they're putting these people on buses and telling them, hey, you know, it's going to be a great journey at the other end. That's what the that's what the coyotes are doing. That's mm. what the people at the other the these Republicans in the, you know, so-called anti-immigration conservatives, they're shooing the migrants along exactly the same way was that was done to the migrants the whole trip up from Venezuela or wherever it is. And the other thing is the liberals in Washington, right? Like, oh, we're a sanctuary city, says the city of Washington, D.C. And then they're doing exactly the same thing Abbott's doing. They're putting a lot of these people on buses to other locations from Washington. They're paying their way. They're buying them tickets. This is exactly what's happening from Texas. Again, sending the problem along, somebody else will deal with it. We can't go on this way. Okay, so that sounds like we will both sort of grudgingly award Abbott and Ducey a point. They have a point in this debate. Maybe not the best way to make it, but we understand where it came from. Now let's go to an issue where Doug Ducey deserves no points, zero points, negative points. Take away any points he's ever had and light them on fire. Because Doug Ducey is one of those Republicans that went around in the gubernatorial primary in his state. He's the governor right now. He's term limited out of it. He tried to get behind the candidate that was opposing the Trump-backed Carrie Lake. But of course, as we know, Carrie Lake won the primary. She will be the Republican nominee in the state of Arizona. But let's listen to a little bit of sound from not that long ago when Doug Ducey was trying to defeat her. Karen Taylor Robeson will be the best person to be a fresh new leader for the state of Arizona. Her opponent, on the other hand, 
bears no resemblance, her campaign or even her personal interactions with me, to anything she's done over the past 30 years. This is all an act. She's been putting on a show for some time now, and we'll see if the voters of Arizona buy it. And how does this play into the national conversation, particularly about, as I mentioned, the election in 2020? Carrie Lake is backed by the former president in large part because she says the 2020 election was stolen. Well, Carrie Lake's misleading voters with no evidence. She's been tagged by her opponents with a nickname, Fake Lake, which seems to be sticking and actually doing some damage. Oh, forget all that, because uh, over the weekend after Lake was declared the winner, Doug Ducey tweeted, As co-chairman of the Republican Governors Association, our organization is already active on the airwaves supporting Carrie Lake's candidacy. Congratulations to Carrie on a hard-fought victory and to all the candidates who will be carrying the GOP banner in November which I guess includes Doug Mastriano. So for, forget all the fake Lake stuff. Right. And then we have to ask about fake Ducey, of course, because which which is the real Doug Ducey, the guy who called Carrie Lake a faker or the guy who now endorses her? Um, I guess this is standard political fakery. One of the things that interests me about Ducey's, what Ducey said about Lake a couple of weeks ago is, I think we were discussing this. He didn't say she was crazy, right? Because let's Carrie Lake, just to be clear for everybody, is one of the outright election deniers, a person who claims that the election of 2020 was was corrupt and rigged. She, she says it was rigged and stolen. The, the whole slate of Republican candidates who got nominated in Arizona said that. So he could have said she was crazy. He didn't say she was crazy. He said she was fake. And part of what I'm wondering here, as, as Ducey, the faker, turns around and endorses her, is, is he just figuring, okay, so she faked her way through the primary and now she'll turn around and be the Carrie Lake who I thought she was for 20 years or whatever it was, you know, somebody who didn't actually subscribe to this MAGA stuff, the, the woman who, who hung out with and enjoyed the company of drag queens, a, a closet lib. Uh, maybe he thinks that that's who she's going to be, or maybe he's just putting his name on a statement because he thinks as co-chair of the, the RGA, he, he has to do that. What do you think, Amanda? Yeah, I think it's the latter. He's playing his role as the chairman of the RGA. And if you get elected, then we will throw our support behind you no matter what we think. I mean, this is this is the problem with tribalism. And he made a go of it uh, even before this election and going around to some of the pro-democracy groups and, you know, posturing as the good guy. And give him credit, when Donald Trump tried to call him to overturn the election in 2020, he famously didn't take the call. But this is a time that calls for doing a little more than pressing the mute button and going along with the election denying candidate because everyone else is going along with the election denying candidate. And Jim, Jim Swift wrote a good piece for us a little while ago saying, do not congratulate Doug Ducey because I think Jim saw this coming. I also saw it coming because I observed what Doug Ducey didn't do when the whole state was being consumed by this utterly ridiculous cyber ninjas fraud it that took control of the legislature and went on for, I think, a year and a half. And there were very good upstanding Republicans in Maricopa County who resisted the efforts to go along with this and really got down and dirty talking to voters and saying this is not true, fighting back every inch on social media and press conferences and statements, trying to explain to voters why this was just all BS. And while all that was going on, what Doug Ducey do? Absolutely nothing that I could see. And so this is, you know, it's it's disappointing, but I think all the Bullock listeners are pretty savvy in sniffing this kind of stuff out. Not surprising, but it leads me to a profile of Liz Cheney over the weekend, the New York Times, Jonathan Martin wrote it. And, you know, she's essentially, God, I hate to say it, um, I think preparing to lose her primary, which is coming up on August 16th, but also explaining why the stakes are so high and I think why she's not going away anytime soon. And of course, she was asked the question, you know, what about Ron DeSantis? And she was extremely firm in saying that she didn't think she could back him because of how closely he has aligned himself with Trump. And that is really, I mean, that's going full Amanda Carpenter. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's where I am. And the line that she drew is essentially saying she can't support anybody who denies the election. And I think that is perfectly reasonable, but that's, I, she's out there. She's out there as far as you can be. 
Yeah. Okay. So a, a couple of things. First of all, I, I wanted to say one more thing about the Arizona situation. Oh, which sure. is, we can sit here and say, you know, Doug Ducey is just signing the onto this tweet because he's there, this statement because he's in his role as RGA, whatever. It 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 gets it gets a lot more serious if the election in Arizona in 2024 is close for the reason that if Carrie Lake is the governor of Arizona and if Mark Fincham is the secretary of state of Arizona, um, these are the Republican nominees for those two roles. We have at that point, a governor who has said that the 2020 election was stolen and rigged. We have a secretary of state of Arizona who says that Trump won. That guy, Mark Fincham, actually was outside the Capitol on January 6th. Um, And these are the people who you know, what happens if there's another Doug Ducey situation? And instead of Doug Ducey being the person who sits there and doesn't take the call from Donald Trump, um, we have these two people in charge of Arizona. Things could get really scary because they have the power to completely mess with the election at that point. So I just wanted to set that aside. Yeah, no, it's important. I mean, we can bring this back around to DeSantis and Cheney. You know, she is taking out the position that Republicans cannot support election deniers. Good. That is a good position. It's a very hard one to maintain. She might be the only one on the national stage that does it. Um, But what is curious about Ron DeSantis is how everybody is rallying around him as the, you know, presidential candidate in waiting. And he would be Trump, but better. We get the policies without the tweets. And he, I think he's cuddling up with the election denying crowd. And every way he can without coming out and saying it. And the next big clue for that uh, came, I saw a tweet from Rick Klein, ABC News reporter, that says, Inbox, Governor DeSantis is teaming up with Turning Point Action, that's a Charlie Kirk MAGA adjacent thing, for rallies this summer and fall in New Mexico, Arizona, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. So DeSantis is going to rally for candidates in Pennsylvania and Arizona who would those candidates be, Will? (laughs) Right. And actually, Amanda, I think it's not just those candidates. It's, I mean, here's my general view of how to think about this. Do you believe that the problem in the Republican Party has been and is Donald Trump? Or do you believe that the problem has been and is the Trump base? Uh, Because that's what Liz Cheney is getting at. It can be both. It's the Trump that brought out the worst in the Republican base. But continue, please. (laughs) Right. Well, I mean, Trump could drop dead tomorrow. And a lot of Republicans, even those who say they like him, would love for that to happen, right? He just, he disappears. And they sort of imagine at that point that the problem goes away. But what if they're wrong, right? What if the problem is that there is this base of people in the Republican Party who love this sort of conspiratorial stuff um, and who uh, don't, you know, have any particular values that correspond to traditional conservatism other than resentments? Um, bigotry, and and that that persists, and that all of these politicians, like Doug Mastriano in Pennsylvania, like Carrie Lake in Arizona, are playing to that base. That base is driving everything. That plus the cowardice of these politicians, so that um, and I think this is Liz Cheney's point. Uh, this is what Liz Cheney is coming around to. If that is the problem, then the Republican Party itself is. I mean, Liz Cheney, God bless her, used the words in this wonderful New York Times where she said the party is very sick. She said she's not sure it can be healed. And, you know, if that is true, then at some point you have to ask whether the party itself can be a vehicle for its own recovery or whether you have to walk outside the party and take your values of constitutionalism and conservatism with you. Okay. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to play some clips from CPAC that will make your point that it is the party. It's not just Trump. It's not just the voters. It's systemic at this point. Let's hear from Rick Scott, who we heard from earlier, who, remember, not that long ago, was the normie Republican governor-turned-senator businessman from Florida. Let's listen to how he framed the conflict ahead. We survived the War of 1812, the Civil War, World War I and II, Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War. But now, today, we face the greatest danger we have ever faced. The militant left wing in our country has become the enemy within. And then he went on to elaborate on some of those conflicts. They are working hard to redefine our country, silence their opponents, and that means each of you. They're destroying about just everything they touch, and they've got their hands on everything. All right, so does that sound like a normal Mitt Romney Republican to you? Well. 
I'm remembering Mitt Romney and his, you know, reminding us that Russia was a serious threat when nobody else did. That, Amanda, is a real thing. Russia turned out, it was and is a real threat. There's literally a war going on in Ukraine because of Russia. What Rick Scott is talking about is this fake mamby-pamby war that a bunch of self-styled conservatives who never served a day in the military, never seriously faced a war, the way that, you know, the way Ted Cruz, the way Rick Scott oh, talked about we got a, we got a, We got another clip because I wanted to contrast with how Rick Scott talked about, you know, these fake namby-pamby wars, as you put them, and how Ted Cruz, my former boss, did. Here we go. In the Senate every day, I represent 30 million Texans in my job. It's like the old Roman Coliseum where you slam on a breastplate and you grab a battle axe and you go fight the barbarians. And as they say in the military world, it is a target rich environment. Okay, so I I think you'll draw a distinction here. I'm going to say that these are basically the same thing. Like, to me, the most important word in what Ted Cruz said is they, as they say in the military, people who actually know what it is like to deal with a real war, with a real enemy. People like Ted Cruz and Rick Scott have no idea what that is, so they've invented this fake enemy, this internal enemy. And as we saw on January 6th, when there's violence of Americans against Americans, that I mean, that's it's a it's dangerous rhetoric. The, the idea that the, the left is the enemy, and we have, but but it just betrays this this deep unseriousness about. I mean, honestly, what I want to do is we're, we're just talking about buses. Can we put Ted Cruz? and Rick Scott on a bus and send them to Eastern Ukraine. I mean, we're gonna have to send that bus on a ferry over the ocean, but let, let them go see what a real war is like so they stop talking about these fake, you know, PC wars in the United States. Yeah, it's stunning because it went from, you know, we want a senator who will fight, right? Like we want someone who fights, that's why we like Trump, he fights, he fights. But now we are talking about just everything, it's extremely militaristic terms, at CPAC, there was, you know, they have these giant lighted almost banners that go above stage. And at one point it said, we are all domestic terrorists. Like they're trying to make it, we are the deplorables, but now it's, we are domestic terrorists. And then of course, I think everybody saw the image of Marjorie Taylor Greene going into the fake jail cell <laughs> with the, you know, pretend insurrectionists and falling on her knees and praying with them because he, he's this political prisoner and is, he's being unjustly persecuted. I mean, there is a lot going on here, but none of it's good. Yeah, I mean, that scene kills me. It kills me because it exposes the fakery of Republicans about being tough on crime. It turns out that Republicans only talk about crime when it's black people or brown people or the left, Antifa, whatever, you know, it's it's George Floyd protests, it's Portland. But when it actually comes to a bunch of nice white Christian Trump supporters staging a violent attack on the Capitol, suddenly like, oh, we're the party of civil liberty the cops are evil. They shot Ashley Babbitt. So that's that's totally fake. The other thing I just wanted to add to this is these Republicans who are talking about, you know, Ted Cruz, what he saw in some movie, the Coliseum, you know, that kind of violence. When it comes to a real enemy, like what's going on in Russia, CPAC hosted, they had Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, as their, you know, keynote speaker, right? And Orban's speech, he's talking about like, peace, we need to make peace with the Russians. You know, there's too much war going on in Ukraine. We need to sit down and negotiate with this nice man, Putin. That, so when it comes time to be really tough on crime, they're not. When it comes time to face a real military enemy, they're not willing to do it. True to those points. But what they're really projecting is a lust for violence against their political enemies. I mean, right? That that is the message up and down, and it gets to what we we're talking about earlier. That this isn't just Trump; it is party wide. It's not just Trump. You have Ted Cruz acting like he's a Roman gladiator, right? Sure, he's not doing it. He's not actually going to war, but he's talking like he is, and there's an audience for it cheering that went to war on January six because that's what they were looking for. And we have another clip that I want to play from Nikki Haley, another one of these, you know, nice normal Republicans. Um, she was asked uh, whether Trump should run or not in 2024. And hear how she talked about the January 6th committee. 
Given revelations from the January 6th committee hearings this summer that President Trump still encouraged the crowd to go to the Capitol on January 6th, even though he knew some of them were armed, that the fake electors uh, plan was illegal and he still put pressure on Vice President Pence at the time. Um, does that give you any cause for concern? Should he not run in 2024? Well, I think President Trump will decide for himself if he wants to run again. And the January 6th has been a biased committee from the start without anyone pushing back on any of the information they have. So it's very hard for Americans to trust it. Yeah. And there was another point in the interview where she's talking about we've got enemies trying to come after us. We've been weak and asleep at the will. And then somehow she tries to make it an argument for herself and saying, you know, sometimes you need a woman to do the job and invoke Margaret Thatcher as if she's anything like her. Okay. Part of what we're seeing is who are the true people of courage in the Republican Party? Who are the true hawks, for example? Who are people who are, believe in toughness? And who are the fakers, right? Liz Cheney is a hawk. Liz Cheney, God bless her, understands that what happened in the United States on January 6th is what happens in other countries. It's an attempted coup. And if you believe in you know standing up to tyrants, standing up to thugs, and standing for, up for the rule of law of overseas, you should stand for that at home as well. People like Nikki Haley are fakers. Nikki Haley was, you know, ambassador to the UN and she pontificated, she postured all the time about human rights and constitutionalism and tyrants. But when the tyrant is in her own country and when she thinks she needs the, that being Donald Trump and when she thinks that that tyrant can help her with her political career being president eventually, um, she, she knuckles under to him. She won't say, I mean, it's one of the things that's absolutely clear, and God bless Mike Emanuel for pointing it out in that Fox clip. You, the hearings have established that Trump knew that crowd was armed and sent them to the Capitol. Hearings have established that Trump was told that his the schemes that he was trying to get Mike Pence to do to overturn the election were illegal. He went ahead with them. It's an open and shut case, and Nikki Haley, who styles herself as someone who will stand up to despots, absolutely refused when she was asked to stand up to this despot. She refused to do so. Yeah, and I get the argument that, well, if you want to be a Republican campaigning for office, you, you've got to make good with the Trump base. But what is she campaigning for? Like, what what does purpose does she think she has to serve after this? As long as Trump's on the scene, she doesn't have a prayer, and she's not willing to engage in any kind of meaningful activity against Trump. So what is your point? And it pains me, you know, I take your points, they pain me to hear because I really used to like Nikki Haley. I used to be excited by her. I thought maybe she could be the first female president. And it is just, there's nothing to be excited about there. I don't even know why she would be booked for an interview because she has so much nothing to say. Yeah. Well, it's just sometimes they put people on TV because they know they will say this. You know, she had, she had an opportunity to stand up. She could have just straightforwardly answered the question, say, yes, I am concerned. Yes, it is wrong to send an armed mob to the Capitol. She just didn't say that. She was also asked, by the way, one of the other things in that interview that I really credit uh, Mike Emanuel for doing, he asked her about Josh Hawley, the Missouri senator, mm -hmm. voting against expanding NATO and to include Sweden and Finland. It was a 99 to 1 vote, right? But here's Josh Hawley, so-called America First. It was He's Hawley. I assumed it was Rand Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't even look at it. Okay, good to know. So Hawley votes against welcoming Sweden and Finland into NATO. Insane, right? On if you believe in standing up to Russia, and you know he's, uh, it, it will, he doesn't have a good answer. But Mike Emanuel asks Nikki Haley in the in the interview, "Was Senator Hawley wrong to vote no?" That's the direct quote, and she refused to answer. She she goes on and she sort of makes the case for NATO separately. But someone who was really strong, someone like Liz Cheney, would have said yes. Senator Hawley was wrong to vote against the expansion of NATO. Nikki Haley won't say that because she only talks tough when it's convenient for her politically. When yeah. it actually costs her something, when it actually requires courage, she is a coward. Well, now that you told me this, I know what she's playing for. She's playing for another appointment or a handpicked job in the next Republican ticket or administration. If she's not willing to even criticize Josh Hawley, who doesn't even have a longest long shot chance of being president, I don't know, the next 10 years at least, that says she's not willing to make a single enemy who may be in a position to help her uh, in the near future, which is really strange, but that all makes sense to me now. Okay, uh, let's put her aside because I know you have been closely watching all of the um, abortion developments. Um, of course, I haven't had a chance to touch base with you since Kansas, where I think I was 
you know, I was proven wrong with my pessimism that uh, the issue wouldn't generate turnout in the way that Democrats have promised. Uh, They completely blew out the turnout numbers. I do think there's a bit of a difference than other types of elections because it was a single issue referendum. Um, But I want your reaction to that and also what happened in Indiana over the weekend. Well, yeah. So Indiana has enacted a, an abortion ban. Um, it's uh, it, it's a little bit peculiar because they allow have an exception for rape or incest, but only if you report it in the first ten weeks. So they've got a time limit on rape, which is I think politically kind of bizarre, morally kind of bizarre. Um, that what we're seeing, what we saw in Kansas, and what we're seeing since then is just the beginning of what I think will be a significant political backlash. As you point out, the I mean, the turnout in Kansas was enormous. It was like the the turnout on the abortion referendum was certainly larger than the two primaries and the two parties put together, and like double, more than double what what the turnout was, I believe, four years ago. And we're also seeing national polling showing that about 50% of the country wants candidates who are on the pro-choice side, and only about a quarter wants candidates who are going to do more to, to restrict abortion. So it, what the, the trailing indicator here is politicians who are beginning to see on TV, Republican politicians backing slowly away. Yeah, can we people, take a minute? Because there was some really great sound from Nancy Mace uh, doing a little bit of what I think you're describing here over the weekend. It's going to take Republicans and Democrats working together to get it in a place where you can do it in a bicameral fashion, in a bipartisan fashion, and pass legislation. And I think you can look at gestational limits that are reasonable for most Americans. Um, But also, you've got, and one of my concerns is you've got states that uh, are going to try to ban women from traveling, that don't, that if you're raped, that you've got to report it to the police. Well, I was raped when I was 16. And it took me a week to tell my mother. By that time, any evidence would have been gone. Um, and the, the violation of a woman's privacy, I can't tell you how traumatic that event was in my life. In my own home state, they want women to be required and mandated to report yeah. uh, when they are raped. And I just can't even imagine a world where you're a girl, a teenage girl who's been raped, to have to report those things. And, you know, Handmaid's Tale was not supposed to be a roadmap, right? Yeah. Um, this is a place where we can be we can be in the center, we can protect life, and we can protect uh, where people are on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, one note on that, what they passed in Indiana requiring those reporting requirements you described exactly, Will, that wasn't done in a bipartisan fashion. So I'm, I'm not sure what she's talking about there, but she's sounding like a lib putting on the Handmaid's Tale hat. <laughs> Yeah, that, I'm joking well, people. <laughs> the the Handmaid's Tale thing was I was kind of blown away when she said that because you expect to hear that from Stacey Abrams, not uh-huh. from Nancy Mace. But it, I think Nancy Mace can see. I think a lot of Republican politicians look at the results in Kansas and they see okay. In, the, in an actual field test, we have now have evidence that a lot of Democrats are turning out and a lot of Republicans are uncomfortable with banning abortion altogether. And so you see Nancy Mace, she, she used the term about being in the center. She talked about gestational limits. This, by the way, was what John Roberts, the chief justice, wanted, you know, for the court to just approve like a Mississippi thing, 15 week limit. The public is with us on that. But no, the court went further. And the legislatures, Indiana and other states, going further, banning abortion altogether. And and clearly there was a backlash in Kansas. And so we see people like Nancy May saying, hey, we're going too far, trying to restrict women from traveling, um, trying to you know, ban abortion, even in cases of rape and incest. The public will not stand for this. So the question I think, Amanda, is how far are these pro-life Republicans willing to back up from their previous position in order to avoid that backlash? What do you think? Well, I think a lot of the reason the referendum won so overwhelmingly in Kansas is that they spoke to people who had concerns like Nancy Mace, who people who consider themselves to be pro-life, myself included, and are really worried about the level of government tracking and monitoring and surveillance that would be required to do what our more extreme pro-lifers say that we all want to do. Like, that's not the case. We don't want to stop women from crossing state lines. We're not going to, you know, make everything, you know, doctors be subject to prosecution because they provided a woman care in an emergency situation. And if you looked at the way this issue was messaged in Kansas, they spoke to those concerns. It wasn't the hardline, you know, liberal, my body, my choice, extreme talking points that turn a lot of red state voters off. And so if you can find a way to talk to Nancy Mace 
on this, I, I think you have a winning argument. And if anyone is looking for a breakdown of that, in um, Charlie Sykes' morning shots last week, he had a rundown of a lot of those ads. Um, I think they're extremely powerful, extremely persuasive. And it's why for anyone interested in politics, not to rely on a pure base turnout model for elections, but to engage in the persuasion model. We are actually willing to talk to each other, take your concerns seriously, and have a civil, productive dialogue about it. Yeah, I think that's a good lesson, the productive dialogue. And the other thing is, this is something that Democrats can run against, right? We started off the show talking about all the things Democrats can run for, right? We're, we're for, you know, the climate bill, we're for the infrastructure bill and all the, and the PACT Act and all the other stuff. But it helps if you want to get people to turn out, it helps for them. It helps you to have something to run against, to tell people you need to stop the bad guys. And Democrats control the House, control the Senate, control the White House, but they do not control the Supreme Court as evidenced by the Dobbs decision, and they do not control the state legislatures. And I wonder how much the midterms might be affected by a lot of voters feeling that they need to come, Democrats feeling, you know, I know my party controls a lot of government, but I'm afraid about what my state legislature is going to do on abortion, and I need to come out and vote. We shall see. All excellent points as always, Will. It's always so good talking to you and everyone. Charlie Sykes will be back behind the mic tomorrow. Thanks for listening. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast, and we'll be back tomorrow to do this all over again.